The Dan York State of Mind program is brought to you at part by Lookout Rhode Island and Taco Comfort Solutions. Good evening and welcome into my state of mind here. I'm Dan York and this evening we have an important conversation with our top law enforcement official here in the state. He is Peter Narona and uh, he has two initiatives that he is embarking upon. One which is non-legislative, the other which is legislative. Uh, he is increasing his oversight on how police do their work and is actually looking to legislate a borrow of what has been a federal program to be more uh, able to be able to pick a department that looks like it's struggling with relationships with the community, so to speak, and uh, and dig in and help. We'll we'll get to that coming up uh, in a couple of moments. In the meantime, we'll talk about some of the contemporary issues of the day with the Attorney General when we come back here on My State of Mind. Please don't forget. And welcome back to my state of mind. This is a Tuesday evening program, of course, and uh, our conversation with uh, our Attorney General Peter Narona was recorded uh, yesterday afternoon. And as has been the issue with uh, with the news cycle, things move very, very, very quickly uh, on a lot of different fronts. So um, we'll do the best we can to stay contemporary here. Uh, General, it's a uh, it's go so good to see you. Thank you for joining me. Sure, Dan. Good to see you. The the uh, conversation is going to be about two major initiatives that you're trying to embark upon here when it comes to your your office's interaction with law enforcement and and they're intricate in, in so many ways. So I want to get to that momentarily, but I can't help in this midday Monday knowing what the news is probably talking about over the cycle through Tuesday evening that the governor is 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 proffering that she, as, as we are speaking here on, on Monday afternoon, is going to issue an executive order to remove plantations from, or Providence plantations, from the, the, the state stationery. I have some process qualms with this, but before I opine, um, do you have a personal thought, and is there any, any uh, involvement with your office about this whatsoever? No, I haven't talked to the governor about it at all, and, uh, in, you know, in terms of of how she's doing it and whether the executive order is the way to do it or not is not something that she's talked to us about. Um, you know, so so uh, I understand why she's doing it. And certainly this has become, you know, a conversation that's been had up with the legislature. The speaker made some comments about about it last week. Uh, the governor is now taking steps. So look, I understand, I understand uh, the concern and I'm sympathetic uh, to the concern about it. I mean, really where I sit, Dan, and I hope I know we're going to get a chance to talk about it is you know, I understand the symbolism of this, and that's important. What I've tried to do here uh, as AG is focus on what are the concrete things that I can do, given what my jurisdiction is to make things better, and that's really where my focus has been. Okay, so when somebody point blank asks you, do you support removing the term from the state's official name, the answer is? Yeah, I do. I do. I mean, I think, I think enough people uh, have a concern about it, that it impacts them in a way that, frankly, you know, has not impacted me. I've never really thought about it, you know, frankly. The number of times I've ever used that, that section of, a, of the state's name is, I can't think of one time I've ever actually used it, you know. But at the same time, if it really causes a concern for so many of our, of our residents, as plainly it does, then I don't have an objection uh, to shorting our name. And um, and, and so, yeah, I support it. I mean, how you do it, I think, you know, legally, I'm, I'm not sure, and I'm the state's lawyer. At some point, I'm going to have to, have to, I suppose, figure that out. But in terms of how, it, of, of doing it in the, in the first instance, yeah, I support it. Yeah, well, it, it's interesting because the, I, I, I'm kind of on the same page with you. The outcome is not something that I'm, I'm, I'm quarreling with. There's an argument about the history and, you know, whether Roger Williams' intent, and of course he was not a slavery guy, but certainly all that stuff was, was, uh, was corrupted over the course of the, the, the late 17th century. And uh, the history is unequivocal. There's, there's no doubt about that. But, you know, I, I get concerned, and I, this is where I wondered, wondered about whether your office will have to weigh in with any kind of legal opinion or whether this will just go to the court if it does, if somebody says, hey, listen, you can't do this. If the governor goes ahead and, and signs an executive order eliminating the references, maybe even that means your office, too, when you've got, you know, paperwork and letterhead and all that kind of thing. I, I, I don't know where else the omission 
counts because to your point, I never introduced myself as somebody from Rhode Island and Providence Plantations. No one ever speaks about it. The state of Rhode Island is how we, is how we refer to it. So it seems to me the exclusive instrument is, is what she's executive ordering out. And, and without a referendum uh, for such, and, and I, I, I'm just, I, I'm, I'm, the legal part of this whole thing puzzles me. Yeah, look, I think, look, I looked at our symbol this morning as they came in. It's the state of Rhode Island on it. So I think she can certainly change uh, things like letterhead and, and, and uh, you know, business cards and all that kind of thing. I think it comes down to, you know, where does the official state name reside as a matter of law? I just don't, I just don't know that. I, mean, I, wasn't, I wasn't aware that she was going to do it until I read about it in the paper today. So no, undoubtedly, someone, someone will, will raise an objection as to kind of the legal import, wherever that lives, and I imagine we'll get involved then. But, but in terms of sort of how we present ourselves, uh, that's a step, as I understand what she's doing today, um, I think that makes sense, and, and I'm supportive of it. All right, so you know what? Why don't we just pause here, folks, so I can, I can get into a deeper conversation with the intended uh, content for this evening with the Attorney General. Pena Rona is my guest, and we shall return in just moments here on My State of Mind. Stay with us. And welcome back to my state of mind. Uh, Peter Narona is my guest, and uh, our attorney general has always made good on the promise to be accessible. Uh, he's also very, uh, very disciplined, as he was as U.S. attorney, in discussing things that uh, media types like me are, are, are trying to learn. Um, they'll tell us when they're ready, usually, but uh, we go through the motions a little bit here. Uh, General, there's a lot of rumor and discussion at the State House that the indictments could be pending. Uh, I don't know whether it's wishful thinking or whether it's just uh, the normal chatter. Can you, can you tell us uh, where any investigation progress might be going, be the speaker or anything close to it? No, I mean, I just, I just don't comment on, on whether we're doing investigations or not. And, and so, you know, let me just say this. It, I don't know where the rumors start or what the rumor mill is or who passes rumors around, but, but I'm pretty confident that the work of this office, and I'm not commenting about anything in particular, but anything that we're working on uh, that's at all sensitive, um, it's just not something people are going to know about because it just doesn't get out from this office. So, you know, uh, I'm not commenting on, on ongoing investigations of any kind. We don't confirm or deny investigations unless where there's a real you know, public uh, need to know, say in an emergency situation, it's just not something we do. So look, if we're doing any kind of investigation when we're at the end of it, if I can release the results of it, I will. Really trying to get that legislation through the, through the House and the Senate again this year, but, but I just don't have any comment beyond that. Yeah, got that. Um, but talk to me about process anyway. I mean, you've got, you've got, a, you've got a challenge uh, with the COVID thing. Uh, you know, people deserve due process, and it, it gets hard. Uh, how bottled up were things, and how are things right now? Well, there are really two ways we charge cases. One is by information, and that kept going. That's where the police bring packages of information in for non-capital offenses, non-life sentence uh, cases, and that we're way uh, we're way up to date on that. To the extent you can be way up to date, we are up to date. We're screening cases today that the police made arrests on last week. Where we had a backlog is on the cases that require a grand jury. So that's capital offenses, ca cases carrying up to a life sentence. We had to get that going by the end of May, because if we didn't, because if we didn't, people who are facing those kinds of charges might be entitled to bail. And on serious cases like murder and sexual assault and child molestation, we don't want them back out there on the street. They have a right to a bail hearing, they've had that, but then we've got to get them indicted by a certain period of time. So the grand jury is focusing obviously on those cases first because they pose the greatest threat to public safety. All right, makes sense. Um, let's shift gears here and and talk about how tough a time it's been. I mean, this is this has been very difficult. Not only do we have uh, a disease that we're trying to cope and, and, and deal with, we now have, I don't know, more tumult uh, in the country than I can remember in recent history. I was very young when the 60s and, and 70s were, were very, very difficult. So I don't think I have the personal credibility to compare them. Uh, but in, in my in my adult lifetime, I, I haven't seen it so contentious. Do you agree? I, I totally agree, Dan. Yes, yes, I, I totally agree. Particularly from a place of law enforcement, community relations, I don't think I've ever seen it this challenging. I've always been worried about that, about that challenge if it were to come. I think we're there now. George Floyd, God rest him, uh, is is at the heart of this, and the Atlanta case is is right behind it. And actually, there's. I think there's actually some ironies in that that are uh, um, 
and something we should talk about. Well, let's talk about the cases, and then we'll talk about your remedies or, or, your, or your approaches, because I know you've got kind of a two-tiered thing. One is more immediate, the other is legislative. Um, uh, the Floyd thing was revolting to most, right? Uh, I'm guessing. No, no sure. That. sure. It's, it's just hard to watch that video and not, and not come to any conclusion other than that's a police officer who's way over the line, way out of control. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the prosecutors have made uh, their decision out there to go forward. Makes sense. Total sense to me, but, but leave the law out of it. I mean, just to see it, uh, it just comes across as incredibly callous. Um, so yeah, incredibly troubling, disturbing. And, and, and you know, it took uh, Minnesota and its attorney general to get to a place where they actually upgraded the, the, the murder charge that, that goes along with that. Ironically, in Atlanta with the Rayshard Brooks case, there are, you know, there are folks who, who see the rationale based on the struggle that Mr. Brooks uh, engaged in and then ran Yet that attorney general uh, or district attorney actually in, in Atlanta, um, you know, threw the book at him. I mean, mm -hmm. he, he threw the whole enchilada at him. Did, did, just as an as a expert in law enforcement, did that make sense to you? Well, look, I think, I think one of the critical issues here, Dan, is, is this tension between getting it right and getting an answer to the public that's demanding one. I had a colleague, a former U.S. attorney colleague, who's a national commentator, and she was she was she raised this the other day, and I it's one of the rare times I'll tweet back at somebody that she had a really good point. That is a tension that we all face when we have cases like this. There, there's tremendous pressure from the public to get out there with answers, to do something, to take action. Uh, at the same time, you you don't want to jeopardize your case by doing two things. Number one, making charging decisions that aren't right. Um, or, or I'm thought through all the way, and the, or uh, releasing information that could come back to hurt you later in the context of the case itself. And so, you know, striking that balance is different. The balance has to be drawn differently in, in every case. It's always different depending on the facts. But there is a tension there between quick action and release of information against getting the case right. You know, so take, for example, you've got a case involving multiple officers. You may need the testimony of one of the other officers to make your best case against the one that is principally culpable. I think we're seeing it from news reports a little bit um, coming up in the Atlanta case where one of the officers, according to the DA, is going to testify. According to his attorney, he may not be testifying. I mean, that's the kind of thing you've got to lock down so you know what your case is one way or the other. That, in my experience, that takes time. Uh, and so, you, again, you, you have this tension between moving quickly, uh, getting information out, which, which the public wants and the media wants, and I understand why that is, against getting it right. You don't want a situation like in Baltimore with Freddie Gray, where, you know, there's a lot in the very beginning. Six officers are charged. At the end of the day, three are acquitted. The cases against three others are dismissed or all back on the job. Now, I don't know that case well enough to know whether that's justice or not, but I can't believe that's how the DA down there thought it would play out when she charged those six officers very quickly. Yeah, get that. Ugh, quite the, it, it's quite the time to be in law enforcement. When we come back, I want to talk specifically about your two ideas um, that you'd like to implement to, to um, well, to increase the oversight, I guess, uh, of the Attorney General's office with police uh, activity here in the state. We shall do that when we return right here on the Attorney General Peter Stevens. Tackling the stories and issues that everyone's talking about. Catch Dan York's State of Mind. Log on to WPRI.com, weeknights at 8. My State of Mind with uh, Peter Narona, the Attorney General. So, Right to it. You've got two initiatives. One seems to be uh, something you can move on immediately. The other is what you need legislation for. Explain if you could, Jim. Yeah, sure. So there are really two things you're talking about in making sure that we're holding uh, those members of law enforcement who don't do the right thing. And that's, that's clearly the minority. It's nowhere near the majority. But to handle that issue where police step over the line, there are really two ways to address it. One, we can control, and that is to review excessive force cases. We've had a protocol for a long time in this office since when Senator Whitehouse was AG whereby this office uh, reviews use of force, deadly force by police, or custodial deaths, 
We expanded that last week to cover all allegations of excessive force and uses of force involving serious bodily injury. I, I really do applaud the police chiefs for unanimously getting behind that expanded protocol. Um, I think that'll give us an opportunity, I'm confident it'll give us an opportunity to catch these cases in the bud. What really drives that, Dan, is that if we've got to see these cases when they're simple assaults, you know, when it's a punching or a kicking by a police officer, for example, when they're already in custody or in cuffs. If we don't nip that in that kind of conduct in the bud by bringing it to this office for review and potential prosecution, then it could lead to something much worse down the road. Up to date, up to now, that review is being done by city and town solicitors. I think it's better if it's vested in this office, and that's why we made that change. I could control that. Did you, do, did you get some bottom up? Um, and I say that respectfully with all the, the, the districts and the communities uh, and the municipalities, did you get some, some bottom-up feedback, especially in this tumultuous time, that they'd like the burden of that lifted or, or at least um, shared by you? You know, certainly I, talk, I have a community advisory board, which I hope reflects the, the broader community. And I, this is something I've been thinking about for a long time. Even before Mr. Floyd's death, we had two misdemeanor cases that you know, Cranston and Providence brought to us voluntarily. You know, in the context of looking at those cases, I really felt like we ought to expand it. When I brought that idea to my community advisory board, it was just when people volunteered to sit around a table with me from time to time and talk about community issues. You know, it went over really well. It went over well with the city of Providence's community advisory board and some other community folks that I spoke to. But to me, it was really a matter of bringing consistency uh, to something which may not be handled in a consistent way and addressing these problems early within the criminal justice system. And I think it'll have good effect going forward. So how does that dovetail or, or um, let's graduate to the, to the next uh, initiative that, that you're looking for, and that is uh, something you need legislation for. What do you, what yeah. law do you want to write here? Yeah, so what we're looking for is, is civil pattern and practice authority. So our protocol is designed to deal with individual instances where the police step over the line that may be criminal cases. But, but many of these cases don't rise to the level of criminal misconduct. Yet at the same time, there, there may be something about a way that a police department trains or supervises that indicates a broader problem. And what a pattern and practice uh, investigation allows is for this office to go in and really do an analysis of that police department, how they're intersecting with the community, how they're engaging in stop and frisk, you know, how they're supervising and training, when are they using force, how are they training around those issues, and make recommendations you know, with input from the department, from the community, and others as to how they can improve. It's a tool that's been in the toolbox of the Federal Department of Justice since the Rodney King days. It's a really useful tool that this administration in Washington now never uses. I think we can use it to good effect here where necessary, and it's a great tool to have in the toolbox. I mean, to, to change or, or reform LIBOR is a step, but it's not the only step. We have to go farther than that and give us this tool as well. Leo Bohr, the acronym for? Uh, the Police Officers Bill of Rights. And there's legislation pending in the House right now to do that. Senator Metz has a commission that I'm gonna serve on with others to, to look at that issue. But in my judgment, that doesn't go far enough. Uh, certainly we need to make some changes there. But we've gotta have this pattern and practice tool in the toolbox so that police departments, look, and again, I think that's by far the minority of departments, but we're a department just it's just not getting it right consistently. This is a tool by which to fix that. It's been used to great effect around the country, places like Chicago, Baltimore, and elsewhere. Okay. Um, yeah, I just find it ironic, and share your thought here for a second, uh, that the Fed uh, uh, pattern uh, on this, back when you were U.S. attorney, uh, was active, meaning the Obama administration kind of dug this idea. This administration doesn't. Um, you're coming in here and playing this role as attorney general. Um, some might say, uh, hey, listen, uh, just because he's got the skill set in what was a federal program doesn't mean it transfers with Narona, the guy, uh, as talented and, and, you know, your viewpoint being what it is, next guy may not want it. Um, so why create a law or next person may not want it? Why not create, why, why create a law uh, where you think there's a gap in federal oversight, a state law where, where that gap yeah. Well, because I think I think you should have the tools. Now, the next person, you're right, could be like Jeff Sessions, just, just decide this is a tool they never need. But I, look, I, I think somebody ought to have the tool. And if we both have it, then there's an opportunity for the feds or the state to do the work. I think the work is so critically important. It can drive real change around how departments police. And when you drive change in the police department, you build community confidence in that department, and that's better for everybody. I mean, that's really what all of this is about, is developing 
and ensuring confidence from the community in how we're policing. And look, we have to take real steps here. We can't just make statements. We can't just raise flags. We can't just go on marches. We have to do something. Now, that's what I want us in this office to be, be about. And so I'm trying to propose things that hopefully will have an impact. And I think both of these things will. All right, I only have uh, 60 seconds. I, I, the conversations always move quickly with you. Um, do you feel like, though, that both you and I in this conversation need to say something good about cops? Oh, of course. You know, and, and hopefully I, I refer to that in here by pointing out that most of them do exactly the right thing. Look, I've been down in our South Side office, and there's a police substation there. And I've walked into that office, you know, when we were still out and about doing that kind of thing. And I walked to the back of that room. Uh, where they, you know, where they come in to have their dinner. I've caught them at their dinner break every once in a while. Five, six officers, young, uh, diverse, care about their community. There's some great police officers out here in Providence and elsewhere around the, around the state and around the country. But we've got to make sure that when those who step over the line step over it, we hold them accountable because that's bad for the morale in the department itself. So look, the vast majority of, of police officers, far vast majority of police officers in this state do it the right way, led by good chiefs. But we got to have the tools to hold, hold the ones that soap over the line accountable. And that's what we're trying to accomplish here. General, it's always good. Thank you for the access. Uh, and we'll keep touch with this. Uh, appreciate your time. Attorney General Peter Narona. Thanks, Dan. Good to see you. I want to thank Peter Narona, our Attorney General, for, for joining us this evening. And obviously, it's a fluid time when it comes to law enforcement. Uh, some of the challenges that the Providence Police Union have right now with City Hall and, uh, and their public safety director uh, will be on those conversations and more both here and on the radio weekdays 3 till 6 on WPRO. Thanks for tuning in. Good night. The Dan York State of Mind program is brought to you in part by Lookout Rhode Island and Taco Comfort Solutions. Tackling the stories and issues that everyone's talking about. Catch Dan York's State of Mind. Log on to WPRI.com, weeknights at 8.